Well, we're glad you're with us at the Ransom Church for week two of Church on Fire. Uh, as we jump in, I wanted to highlight an opportunity we have coming up uh, to learn more about the how behind this thing we've been talking about called discipleship. If you've been sitting on the fence and you've been like, I don't know if I could disciple someone, we want to do a training on, we're doing a training on March 11th. Uh, and the goal of that training is to take away your fear surrounding discipleship and, and, and kind of unpack the, the fears you might have. And so it, it, I won't feel rude. It, it won't seem rude to me at all if you get your cell phone out right now and you open the app and you just click on the icon and sign up for that right now. It would actually honor us quite greatly. And so because uh, we can't set captives free uh, unless you're a church on fire. And one of the best ways to be a church on fire is to have people just fully committed to the vision, the direction, and, and willing to make disciples. And so if you're kind of sitting on the fence about discipleship, but you'd be willing to consider it, maybe sign up for that class and we could hopefully unpack some of your fears there. Well, I want to read, uh, uh, tell you a story. It's about a, a small town. It's one of those towns, you know, one stoplight, one school, one church, that type of town. Uh, and in this town lived a particularly vocal atheist. And he, he wasn't a bad guy by any means. He was well-liked. He just, he didn't believe, and he was pretty open about that. Uh, and uh, it didn't help that in that town there was one church, and that one church in town operated less like a church and more like a social club, you know what I mean, where uh, there's no, no new decisions for Christ in recent memory, uh, just the same people doing the same thing every, every week. It was very cold, very stale, very dead. Uh, well, one day that one church building in that small town caught on fire. And as happens in small towns, the whole town ran to the church to try to help put the fire out. And ev that included everyone, even the town atheist. And I don't know what came over one of the, the congregants of the church, but as they were all running towards the fire, the congregant saw the atheist running towards the fire and he said, hey, this is something new. This is the first time I've seen you running towards church. To which the atheist replied, well, it's the first time I've seen the church on fire. Um, is that the church? Is that the church we know? And I'm not talking about ransom. Is that the big C church? Could that be said of us? Last week, Dr. McNall talked about Jeremiah and what it looks like to have a, a fire in your bones, to have the word of God, not just in a book or on your phone, but in your bones where you can't help but share the truth about God. And in that sermon, we wrestled with this huge idea that uh, God's fire requires two things of every believer. It requires that we're filled with his word and filled with his spirit. Filled with his word and filled with his spirit. So last week, Dr. McNall fo focused on being filled with God's word. And, and uh, another opportunity for you, I want to encourage you to attend. We're going to be offering a class, uh, a six-week class on his video curriculum of his book, Long Story Short, starting in June. Uh, you can sign on, that, on the app as well. But, but we, we wanted to dedicate that one week to understanding what it means to have God's word in your bones. And, and that's an incredibly important part of it. But the next three weeks of this series, we're going to focus on the second part of the equation. I think maybe because it's the harder one. What does it mean uh, to be filled with God's spirit? What does it mean to be filled with God's spirit? So today, uh, the, I've titled the message Evidence of Fire, because ultimately when God's spirit is moving uh, in you, the evidence is impossible to miss. And the picture of fire, if you think back to last week and, and Dr. McNall's picture of the fire burning towards, you know, their, fire, their, their uh, house and the church there. It just consumes everything in its path, doesn't it? And in fact, when you, when you hear people describe fighting a wildfire, the language that they will often use is, you know, we're trying to contain it or we can't control it. We know that it, it only takes a small spark uh, to start a fire. And we know that. Thank you, Smokey the Bear. Uh, you know, teaching us that even from when we're kids, that only you can prevent forest fires because once that thing gets started, it's just going to go, that it's going to burn out of control. So we should pay attention when we see that fire is often used as a descriptor for God as well. God is, uh, you know, appears to Moses in, in what kind of a bush? A burning bush. It was on fire, but it was not consumed. When you read about uh, God giving Moses the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, it says that he came down on the mountain in the form of smoke and fire. Scripture describes God often as a consuming fire. But nowhere do we see that more in Scripture than when we start referring to God's Holy Spirit. The fire of God's Holy Spirit is kind of a common language, a common theme. And it both refers to the, the illumination that the Holy Spirit brings. When you've got God's Spirit in you, you're aware of things in a different way. But it also speaks to the sheer consuming power of God's Holy Spirit. 
And at the ransom, that's something that we, we pray for. It's something we want more than anything. We spend hours on our knees every week praying for your prayer requests, but also praying that God's Holy Spirit would illuminate our lives and that we would be completely consumed by the power of the Holy Spirit just poured out on our church. Is that okay with you? Whether or not it is, I'm praying it. It's go, you know, and, and Because what's going to change us, and when I say us, I mean the church, not ransom, the church. What's going to change us What's going to turn people into the priesthood of believers and disciple makers and give you the courage to follow God's call for your life and, and, and create a kingdom movement? What's going to change that is not better strategies. It's not offering better studies or better programming. What will change us is the Spirit of God poured out upon the church. Amen? All right. So sadly, too often, we're like the church in the, picture, in the story. Too often, we read about churches that once burned with the Holy Spirit fire, and every one of them did at one point. But over time, that fire has died down. Most of us have had the, the sad experience of watching that happen to churches we loved or of being in a cold, dead church with no fire where everyone and everything is just going through the motions. Maybe they had fire at first, and they, they, you know, but it just started dwindling, and eventually they gave up trying. You know? Maybe they even tried to restart it, but they couldn't get it going. That's the reality for most churches. And it's not even a corporate thing either. It's not just the body of Christ. It's, it's personal as well. Uh, one writer, Addie Zierman, even goes as far in her book, When We Were on Fire, to describe the loss of that fire in this way. She said, somewhere in the growing up, the flame flickered out, and I thought it was because I'd failed somehow. I struck myself like a flint against church after church, trying to ignite some kind of spark. Instead, I ended up angry, hurt, bitter, and broken. And I wonder if that's where we find ourselves today. First, Paul warns us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, do not quench the fire of God's Spirit, and yet so many churches, so many believers, whether intentionally or unintentionally, have done just that. And that's what we want to wrestle with. How do we fight this? How do we reverse this in the church as a whole? Well, turn with me to Acts chapter 1, if you will. Uh, if you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 654. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, you can raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one, and you can follow along. If you don't own one, please raise your hand. We want to give you one. You can go on the app as well, and while you're signing up for those two amazing classes, you can go into the Sunday Services tab, and there's notes there you can fill out and all that good stuff. Now, eventually, we're going to get to Acts chapter 2. Acts 2 is like the go-to passage onto the church. You know, it gives the snapshots at the beginning of the church, and we'll talk more about Acts 2 next week, but a lot of times, you know, churches look for strategies. They try to copy the model. Like, how can we be an Acts 2 church? We see what God was doing there, and we, we want that. So we try to focus on the things that we see in the Acts 2 church, hoping that we'll get the same results. And so I think it's important to understand that the key to what happened in Acts chapter 2, the key to the renewing of the Spirit's fire, is not actually what the church did at all. It's what the Spirit of God did in the church. And the disciples are like living proof that it wasn't us. Okay, if you read the Gospels, you, re you look at the lives of the disciples, have you noticed they're often clueless? Like, I mean, they, I, they're a bunch of guys wandering around with Jesus. They don't get it. They don't know what's going on. You know, he's telling them about he's going to die on the cross. They're like, aren't we great? You know, who's the great? You know, they just like don't, they're not paying attention. That's these guys. They missed it. Well, that all changed in the book of Acts. So let's start with a little background here. This is post-resurrection pre-ascension. In other words, it's after he raised from the dead, but before he went to heaven. And that's important because here Jesus is. He's resurrected from the dead. That's kind of a big deal. He's appearing to hundreds of people. He taught them. He talked with them. He ate with them. He's having incredible conversations with his followers, with his apostles. And in verse 6 of Acts chapter 1, they still say something dumb. Okay, look at verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Now, this is before the Holy Spirit comes and it shows, because these guys, they, they'd heard the parables, they'd gotten the inside teaching, they watched him die, they watched him, you know, they saw him resurrected from the dead. They're hanging out with a guy who used to be dead and is now resurrected. You know, their perspective has been stretched, and yet they're still thinking too small. They're like, hey, are you going to handle the Romans? You're going to set up an earthly kingdom, make everybody Jews, make them follow our, our rules. That's as far as their imagination could take them. And, and Jesus speaks to that in verse 7. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're not for you to know. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus says, you're going to receive the power, and I'm not going to lie, they desperately need it, okay? I don't, I don't, if, if the gospel, if, since day one, we know that these guys are not the sharpest knives in the drawer. They're not the sharpest, they're the, the brightest crayons in the box and other metaphors and analogies, right? If the kingdom of God is hanging on these men, we're not sitting in this room today, okay? If left completely to them, the gospel would have never gotten to us. But here's what you need to understand. Jesus promised the power they needed to do what he has called them to do. And the reason that's important is because he's made the same promise to you. Which means you've got the power you need to do what he called you to do, and you've got something he called you to do. There's a call, and he's empowered you. So this is, Jesus says this to him, he's gone. When we pick up the story, the disciples are waiting. It's the day of Pentecost, uh, which is a huge Jewish celebration. Penta uh, means 50, which means it was 50 days after the Passover. So they, they were celebrating at Passover when the angel of death passed over and, didn't, and the Israelites were spared, the Egyptian uh, firstborn died, but the Israelites are spared. And then they have another party later, 50 days later, called Pentecost, uh, where they're celebrating God's deliverance and, and, and the thanksgiving and the good harvest and all of that. Well, it's, it's within these two parties that are going on, it's been 10 days since Jesus left. He told them, go to Jerusalem, go to this specific room, wait for the Holy Spirit to come. So there's 120 believers sitting in this room, waiting and praying for the Spirit to come, but they have no idea what they're waiting for. They have no idea what that looks like outside the room life's going on as usual everybody's getting ready for the party nobody has any idea that an event is about to occur that will literally change the course of history this is one of those moments in scripture where everything shifts okay let's pick it up acts 2 verse 2 it says suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Listen, when the fire of God's Spirit is poured out, it changes everything. Everything after this moment changes. Men who were cowards are no longer afraid. Peter, who had run away and denied Christ, now stands up proclaiming Christ with boldness. The disciples, who were walking around arguing who was the greatest, are now living life with everything in common. They're selling things. They're making sure everybody's provided for. They, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when the, everybody came to arrest Jesus, they said they would stand with him, but they spread like they just ran away. Here, they're willing to give up their lives for the truth of Christ. And you might say, why? What changed? I'll tell you what changed. The Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, everything changes. You know, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, this means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It becomes about men and women with new hearts. The theological term is regeneration. It's when our old heart is taken out and a new heart is placed in us that leads this internal transformation that leads to such an, a dramatic external change that the whole world can see it. Now when they preach the word, God accompanied it with signs and wonders. Incredible things are happening in the church. See, in churches where God's Holy Spirit is moving, it's obvious, isn't it? And sadly, in churches where God's Spirit is not moving, isn't that just as obvious? So let's keep reading. Verse 5. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were all bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas around Libya, around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. In other words, we're from all over the place. Now here's the important thing. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. So look at what's happening here. All these God-fearing Jews, these religious Jews from every nation are literally, literally the word nation here is ethnos. So every ethnic group is, 
in Jerusalem for this divine moment, all assembled, indicating that this event is about to have worldwide significance. And they gather together. It says they heard their own uh, dialects, and they came running, and it says they came together. The Greek word there is sunerkomai. It's where we get our word synchronized. They were synchronized under the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 12, they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. You ever seen God's spirit move in a way that you were just like, wow, what is happening right now? That's what was happening in this moment. See, the world knows when the church is on fire because they can see the evidence clearly. Now, not everybody's excited about it. Verse 13. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. I mean, any time that you have God moving in miraculous ways, have you not noticed you find people trying to dismiss what's happening, trying to make any excuse not to admit it? <clears throat> well, Peter's not having any of it. He stands up and he speaks with boldness. Now, boldness wasn't new to Peter, but this type of Holy Spirit-driven boldness was new. Peter has been cowering den after denying Jesus. He's embarrassed, but in this moment, the Holy Spirit comes and changes everything, and he's just filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and he begins to preach. And it says in verse 14, Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. That's very sensible. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel, and he's going to go in, and we're going to unpack what the prophet Joel said, but let me pause so we understand this. What Peter is doing right now is different than the Jewish pattern, okay? In the Jewish pattern, even modeled by Jesus, typically a Jewish rabbi would teach just for the Jews, so they would gather the disciples around, they would all sit down, okay? So if the, if the rabbi, the teacher, sat down, you knew you better sit down and lean in because it was going to be good. And, and, and they would gather it around. That's not the picture here. The picture here is that this teaching is not just for an inner circle of people. It is a message for the whole world. It is for all people. Peter is not acting as a teacher. He's acting as a herald. And he starts in on this inspired message. And Peter points out two things. First, he says, more is happening here than meets the eye. He says, these guys aren't drunk. I know what you're thinking, but please hear me out. You can't just, just you, you don't dismiss it this way. You can't just give some lame excuse why God, you, you, you're not seeing what God's doing right in front of you. More is happening here than meets the eye. What's happening cannot be explained away that easily. Second, he said, you knew this was going to happen. At least you should have. They, they should have known this. He said, the prophet Joel spoke about this. Now, you guys might not know the prophet Joel. Maybe you just haven't spent a lot of time reading Joel, but the people at the time would have known this prophecy. And so the point is, they shouldn't have been shocked. They should have seen this coming. And Peter reminds them about the prophecy. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, he, he dives into the prophecy from Joel chapter 2. He, he quotes it. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heaven above, and, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. Then the sun will become dark, and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." Now, I want to dig into that just a little bit, but before I do, how many of you have ever, in, in your travels, had the privilege of going to see the Sistine Chapel? Anybody here? Yeah, a couple people. Super cool. I'm super jealous, and that's all I have to say about that. But uh, I had a friend who recently visited uh, this area of the country and visited, like, a bunch of different sites, and they had, went on a tour, you know, had a tour guide, and the tour guide was like, here's where you can see this, and giving history and facts and all of that kind of thing. And then they got to the Sistine Chapel. And my friend noted, he said, you know, we got to the Sistine Chapel, the, the tour guide stepped into the room, let us step in, because it's pretty tight in there, and, and looked up and he said, this is the Sistine Chapel. And then he just stepped back and shut up. Because the last thing you need in the Sistine Chapel is a tour guide giving color commentary. The work of Michelangelo speaks for itself. Now, some passages of Scripture are actually like that. 
There's some passage where you want to you want to dig in and go, what do they mean in the context and what's the background? What was the original language say? And there are other times in Scripture where you just want to read it, you want to step back and shut up and just leave that stuff alone. And that those, those passages where the last things needed is somebody's commentary. I think this is one of those passages. It's easy to get lost in the complexity of all, but even the scholars don't have a lot to say about this passage. So instead, we're going to sit back, we're going to listen to a few simple truths. The first simple truth is this. God's Spirit, are you listening? God's Spirit is available to everyone. I don't think you were listening, because that's like the best news ever. Let me, let, me, let me say it again. God's Spirit is available to everyone. Oh, there we go. There's a little bit of excitement. Mild excitement. I'll take it. Okay. (laughs) Look at verse 17. It says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. This is a huge deal. Now, let's get some background. Joel chapter 2 in this prophecy, it's full of incredible imagery. It begins by pointing out their current situation. Uh, In Joel chapter 2, there are plagues, the locusts have eaten all the crops, there's drought, the livestock are dying, people are starving, they are like at rock bottom. And then if you're reading Joel 2, in verse 23, you're going to see it turn as he starts talking of God sending rain down on the land, uh, like the picture is a torrential downpour on parched land, okay? And, and, And it's restoring life, it's bringing hope, it's healing the land. Peter quotes this, and he says... That's what's happening right now. Just like God restored the land and poured out his spirit upon parts land, so now the Holy Spirit is being poured out upon a parts church. In the same way God sent the rain, he's also pouring out his spirit. And Peter says, this is happening right now. This is not a, an occasional outpouring. God's spirit is now available to anyone who's open. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't, I don't feel God's spirit. Well, I didn't say everyone would receive his spirit. It said he poured out his spirit on all people. But what we do with it, whether or not we receive it, is up to us. Dwight Moody illustrated this well. He was teaching one time, and he was speaking to a crowd like this. And by the way, I I, I had a a, a pitcher and a glass for this illustration in first service, but then it fell off the table. So you get to use your imagination caps. But uh, he was speaking to a crowd like this, and he held up an empty glass, and he asked, how can I get the air out of this glass? And there were different suggestions. Nobody really had a good answer. So Dwight Moody picked up a pitcher of water and he filled the glass. And he said, now look, all the air is removed. And then he went on to share the following statement. He said, victory in Christ is not accomplished by removing sin, but by being filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again because it is so stinking profound. Victory in Christ is not accomplished by removing sin, but but by being filled with the Spirit. Moody went on to say, I believe firmly that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride and selfishness and ambition and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. But if we are full of pride and conceit and ambition and the world, there is no room for the Spirit of God. We must be emptied before we can be filled. See, at Pentecost, God poured out his Spirit. It was available to all who believed, to all, listen, whose hearts were open to him. How open is your heart? And if it's not, what's filling it? This leads us to our second simple truth. When God's Spirit moves, ordinary people do extraordinary things. We read, it says, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I'll pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heaven above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord. This is an extraordinary picture that he's painting. Prophecy, visions, dreams, And every one of them speaks of God giving us a revelation of himself. And so the picture here is less about prophesying about like the future, like telling, you know, reading the future. It's about teaching and proclaiming the truth of God. See, when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon people, our lives proclaim him. Tim Keller is a founding pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian. He probably sums up as well as I've ever heard how this relates to you and I today. He said this, but on that day, on the day of Pentecost, It wasn't just the apostles that got the tongues of flame. Every single believer, 
Every single one, the humblest, most illiterate, most untrained believer in that room became a burning bush. Keller drives home the statement with this. He said, every Christian is a burning bush. Every Christian is a Mount Sinai. My question to you is, are you on fire for God? That's the power of God's spirit in us. The problem is too many people in the church are scared to play with God's fire. We love the idea of God's spirit moving. We love seeing him move in front of us and around us, just as long as he doesn't move in us or through us. We love seeing God's spirit at work. We're scared of experiencing that work in our lives. And the result is that most churches and most people in most churches are incredibly, incredibly ordinary. They gather together. They have knowledge about Jesus. They talk about Jesus, but there's no sign of God's spirit anywhere, which leads to our final simple thought. If God's spirit is in you, the world will see you differently. Or let me say that another way that's easier to understand but harder to accept. You're going to stand out. When you die to self and the spirit of Christ resides in you, it goes without saying you'll never look the same. Because the call of Christ that that spirit will lead you to live out is countercultural. It's like swimming upstream against the pole when everyone else is floating with the current. And I'd argue this is where most people and most churches chicken out. Because the spirit brings transformation, which sounds great, but the spirit also brings confrontation. And to a lot of people, that doesn't sound so great. Because I want God to transform the brokenness in my life. I just don't want it to affect the way I live. I don't want the power of God's refinement in my life. I don't want to stand up tall in the face of culture. And so instead, I just settle for the way things are. I'm going to turn it over to the campus pastors, but let me leave you with one final thought. I need to point out what God said. He said, I will pour out my spirit. See, God pours out his spirit. His spirit lives in you. So there's no way you can stay the same, and there's no way that it won't overflow pouring out onto everyone and everything around you.